Well, okay, anyway, so uh, sorry for today's a little different. I, uh, I need to leave in the middle of the talk, so Silvia will take over, but I'm happy to introduce David. We're happy to have him today uh, continuing our series of seminars uh, hosted by the Boosting Collaboration, uh, and he'll tell us about the inversion formula in the O2 CFT. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so th thank you for the uh, invitation to talk. So yeah, I'll be discussing some recent work studying the inversion formula and the O2 CFT. Uh, this is based on a paper which came out last year with Sonar Abarak and David Poland, and a paper which came out a few weeks ago with Jun Yu Lu, David Poland, and David Simmons Duffin. And I should also say there was a, a very nice paper that by the McGill Group where they studied uh, similar questions for the Ising CFT. So broadly speaking, the motivation for this work is that we have uh, two different ways of studying the bootstrap. We have the numerical bootstrap, which gives us uh, very precise and rigorous predictions for known 3D CFTs, such as the Ising and ON models. And this is all based on studying CFTs using Euclidean OPE. And we also have the analytic bootstrap, which gives us a window into the large spin spectrum of our theory and can be used to prove the existence of things like regex trajectories. So these are, very, these are very nice organizing tools in the study of CFTs, and I'll be using them repeatedly today. And this is all based on studying CFTs and Lorenzian signature. So some things we'd like to understand is first, how are these two methods related? And is there any useful interplay between them? Also, do all operators sit on regex trajectories? Are there possible exceptions? And finally, can we combine numerics and analytics to study new Lorentzian regimes that go beyond the light cone limit, which is usually studied in the analytic bootstrap? So the first thing we need is that uh, the inversion formula proves that CFT data is analytic in the spin. And because of this nice property, it's natural to plot our spectrum uh, using these true Fauci plots. So we plot the spin as a function of the dimension. And these curves are the regge trajectories. So here I'm plotting an even spin trajectory. And so once you know these curves, you can read off the dimensions of the local operators. So all you do is you intersect these curves with lines of constant even spin. And these dots to the right of the vertical axis tell you about dimensions for the local operators O. And at dots to the left uh, correspond to the shadow operators with dimension D minus delta. And in the exact theory, these trajectories are always shadow symmetric. So this plot is uh, invariant when you reflect across the, heart, the vertical axis. And to be more precise, when I draw these curves, really what I'm drawing are families of light ray operators but for the context of this talk, you can just think about these trajectories as a nice way of organizing the CFT spectrum. So the first thing we wanna understand about this plot is what happens at spin zero. Is the CFT spectrum also analytic for the scalars? So you can see this orange curve uh, intersects the helical zero line at two points. And the problem is whether or not these points correspond to the dimensions of local scalar operators. And whether this holds or not uh, is not guaranteed by the inversion formula, and it's going to be theory dependent. So we like to understand what CFTs have this nice property uh, of uh, scalar of analyticity down to spin zero. And the other question we want to understand is in practice, what data do we need to actually compute these curves? So in principle, the inversion formula tells us how to completely uh, compute these curves once we know all the CFT data. But in practice, in a non-perturbative theory like the Ising or O2 model, we only have access to a subset of the data and we want to understand when that subset is sufficient to compute these curves accurately down to low spin. And I think there's two reasons why one should be interested in this problem. 
So the first, as I said before, is that the even spin points determines the local physical spectrum. So if I have a way of independently computing this curve, I can make new predictions for dimensions and couplings of spinning operators. But more generally, once we start to study CFTs in Lorentzian signature, there are a host of observables and limits that require knowing these curves in full, or at least knowing them for some generic point that doesn't correspond to uh, even spin. So I'll come back to this question later, but first I want to consider the problem of how do we actually compute these curves in practice? I think uh, by now it's well known, especially to this audience, that uh, the Ising CFT, the leading trajectory can, can be computed accurately with analytics. So to explain this, I need to introduce uh, the double twist operators. So these are some composite operators which exist in every CFT. And they have the nice property that when you take their spin to infinity, the twist or delta minus L is just additive. So I get the twist of the two constituent operators plus the number of Laplacians I'm inserting. And these were proven to exist in all higher dimensional CFTs uh, by studying crossing symmetry in the light cone limits. So then in the Ising model, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, the leading trajectory is just this double twist family composed of the lightest Z2 odd scalar sigma. So it has twist or dimension around 0.518. And the original method to compute this trajectory was with the light cone bootstrap. So let me give a brief cartoon for this uh, procedure. So what you do is you take your four point function and you take all your operators to be space-like separated. So here x4 is at infinity. Uh, but then you take the limit where x2 and x3 are becoming null separated. And in this light cone OPE, it's the operators with the minimal twist that dominate. So if you study crossing this limit, what you can show is that identity exchange in this light cone OPE is dual to the exchange of the double twist operators in the cross channel. So that's uh, the one, two OPE here. And similarly, when you let allow for the exchange of some non-identity operators, you can compute the large spin anomalous dimension for these uh, double twists. And this sets up the idea of large spin perturbation theory. Our small parameter is one over L. And in the large L limit, we can compute dimensions and couplings for all these composite operators. And a surprising result uh, in the Ising model was uh, this uh, analytic prediction works well down to low spin. So here I'm uh, taking a plot from a paper of David Simmons Duffin, where we're plotting the twist of the leading trajectory, the sigma sigma operators, as a function of h bar. And this is a nice variable, which I'll use uh, repeatedly in the rest of the talk. So these dots are the numerical prediction, which came from studying the extremal functional and the curve is the analytic prediction from the light cone bootstrap. And there's two surprising features of this result. The first was that the numerics were very sensitive to the existence of the double twist operators. And this is surprising because the numerics uh, are always uh, used, are studied in the context of the Euclidean OPE, while the double twist operators naturally appear when studying the light cone limit, so in a Lorenzian regime. But what this result is saying is that if we want to satisfy crossing symmetry in generic configurations for our correlator, we need to include all these composite operators. And the other surprising result, as I said before, is that this large spin prediction is working well all the way down to spin two. So this dot here corresponds to the stress tensor point and you see that we almost exactly recover the twist of the stress tensor. 
uh, which by conservation is, is exactly one. Uh, so with this result, we now have a picture for the leading trajectory in the Ising model. So making the same uh, true Frouchy plot as before. My leading trajectory is just the sigma sigma operators. Uh, at very large spin, this plot becomes uh, diagonal because all the anomalous dimensions are going to zero. And when you continue to the spin two point, you get exactly the stress tensor. And this gives, I think, a surprising new consistency condition on the CFD data. It says that whatever your input was when studying the light cone bootstrap as output, you have to get a spin two operator with dimension three. Or here it's approximately three because uh, we don't know all the CFD data. And this gives uh, additional motivation to see if analyticity holds down to spin zero. You could play the same game with scalars and require that the output of your light cone bootstrap uh, gives the correct dimensions and couplings for all the scalar operators. And this would be even more constraining because the scalar OP data would be both the input and the output of the analytics. And this has been used uh, to derive very nice results in the context of perturbation theory. Uh, but as I said before, there's other points of interest on this trajectory. And in particular, one point of interest is the Regge intercept L star. So this is just a value of my leading trajectory at exactly delta equals three halves. And this number L star governs the behavior of the correlator when you go to the Regge limit which is an intrinsically Lorentzian high energy limit for your four point function. So now I'll just give a brief picture uh, for this configuration. So the idea to reach the limit, Regge limit is that you have to work in Minkowski space and you take your four operators and you boost them all to null infinity at the same rate. So specifically with these light cone coordinates, x plus and x minus, uh, you choose the following configuration and you take uh, rho and one minus rho bar to infinity with the product held fixed. And the prediction from uh, conformal Regge theory is that in this limit, the correlator has this characteristic growth where L star is the Regge intercept. So whether or not our correlator grows or decays in this limit, depends on whether or not L star is greater than or less than one. And so this limit is uh, very well studied in holographic theories where L star is equal or slightly below two. And there's also a beautiful connection to the study of chaos. Uh, but this limit is a lot less understood for a generic non-perturbative CFT. So one of the goals of this work is to understand this limit in a strongly coupled CFT like the O2 model. Uh, so before getting to all the details, let me give a brief summary of the main results. Uh, so in the first part, I'll use the inversion formula to give uh, accurate predictions for the leading trajectories in both the Ising and O2 CFTs. And I'll show that the inversion formula gives more accurate results than the light cone bootstrap. Uh, then I'll demonstrate that using the analytic predictions for all the double twist operators, we can construct an approximate solution to crossing in the O2 model. I'll also demonstrate how to compute the Regge intercept in the CFT and show that it's approximately 0.82. And because this is less than one, we know correlators will decay in the Regge limit. And finally, I'll show that in the O2 CFT, the scalar sit on regge trajectories. So we have analyticity down to spin zero. And also, of course, uh, if you have any questions or anything that's not clear, uh, please interrupt me. Uh, so in the first part, as a warm up uh, before getting to the O2 model, we'll look at the Ising model, and this will let us introduce most of the main ingredients. 
So in the Ising CFT, we'll look at the lightest z 2 watt scalar sigma. And as usual, we pull off a kinematic prefactor and write our correlator in terms of the cross ratio of z and z bar. And what the inversion formula tells us is that we can reconstruct the full correlator once we know its double discontinuity. So here I've written the S channel D disk, but you can define similar T and U channel double discontinuities uh, by continuing around Z equals one or Z equals infinity. And when we study the inversion formula, it will be convenient to use these weights H and H bar, which are familiar from 2D CFTs. So H is just one half the twist, and H bar is the same variable I introduced before, uh, one half delta plus L. And it's important that uh, in large spin perturbation theory, our small parameter is really one over H bar and not one over L. So uh, this becomes important once we get to scalars where L is zero, but H bar can still be large. And I think it gives some intuition about why uh, we can recover dimensions for uh, very light, well, very low spin operators. Uh, and I will also be using uh, these two labels interchangeably. So twist and spin are nicer when you talk about the local operators, but H and H bar are nicer when you're actually talking about the inversion formula computations. Uh, and you can see this given the inversion formula for the four sigma correlator. So it's very simple. You just take the D disk of your correlator and you integrate it against this SL to our block K. And this defines a generating function for the leading twist OPE data. So the full generating function is more complicated, uh, but this formula will be sufficient for everything I'm discussing today. And now all the OPE data is encoded in the powers and coefficients of Z. So the power of Z tells me that, gives me H as a function of H bar, and it's just multiplied by the OPE coefficients. And once I know this data, I can plug it back into the block expansion to recover the full correlator. And here G are the full 3D blocks. Uh, but to actually determine the physical spectrum, I need to solve this equation that h bar minus h is equal to the spin. And this is not trivial because the inversion formula gives us h as a function of h bar, but not the dimension as, as a function of spin. So next, to actually compute this d-disk, uh, what we'll do is we'll expand it in terms of the t-channel conformal blocks. So now your full generating function becomes an infinite sum for each of these COs corresponds to the inversion of just one block. And of course, in principle, given the exact double discontinuity, we can reconstruct the full four point function. Uh, but in practice, we'll, we'll only have approximations to the D disk from a sum of some known blocks. And for the moment, I'll assume this sum is finite and I'll come back to the infinite sum problem later. Uh, so the next problem we face is that the inversion of a single 3D block isn't known in a simple closed form. So what we'll do instead is we'll expand our 3D blocks as an infinite sum of the chiral 2D blocks. So this is known as dimensional reduction and here I'm labeling my blocks by H and H bar, and the 2D blocks are now just a product of these SL2R blocks. And these coefficients, uh, curly A, can be straightforwardly computed by solving the Casimir equations. So now what you find is that your 3D generating function for the inversion of a single block also becomes an infinite sum of these 2D generating functions. But in practice, what's nice is that for h bar greater than two, this expansion converges very quickly and we can truncate our sum at around p max between five, five or 10. 
And for most of the plots I'll show you today, you can set Pmax equals one and you wouldn't notice any difference. Uh, but the punchline and the important result here is that uh, these 2D inversions will capture both perturbative and non-perturbative terms at the lar in the large h-bar expansion. So by using dimension reduction plus the inversion formula, we can capture terms that would uh, naively be missed in a study of the light cone bootstrap. Uh, so before I can use this to make any predictions, uh, the first thing we need to take into account is that we don't have the exact generating function and we only have an approximation. So at small z, the, the exact generating function has the following form. So it's just a pure power of z times the oblique coefficients. And then it's straightforward to extract the twist. So what I can do is I can take the following combination and then take z goes to zero and that gives me h. And once I know this exponent, it's straightforward to read off the OP coefficients. But uh, in practice, when we invert operators of bounded twist, we find logs in our generating function, which in principle we know should resum into these pure powers. But again, that requires knowing all the CFT data. So instead, what we'll do is we'll take the same combinations here but I'll evaluate them at some small but fixed z. So we want to take z small to isolate the leading trajectory, uh, but we can't take it too small because we know that there are log squared terms being dropped that ensure the right resummation happens. So as a useful yes, compromise yes, between these two problems, uh, we set z equals 0.1. And that gives uh, nice results for all our uh, trajectories. Hi, David. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, what about the other terms? Like you have several powers of z in your c exact or c approximate. And so, how, when you evaluate this derivative, how do you disentangle various powers of z which can possibly contribute to the full expression? I, I mean, the other operators or? I mean, so you, you have C exact contains, uh, I'm reading the first equation, contains yeah. this, this power of Z, but it contains many powers of Z. So which one are you extracting? The, the, the leading one, or do, would you like to extract all of them? What about the subleading uh, powers? Yeah, we in principle want to extract just the leading one, but the problem is there's uh, subleading powers for the, the higher multi-twist trajectories, which contaminate the results. Um, and similarly, the log squared terms, uh, the log squared terms prevent us from taking z too small. Um, yeah, so if I knew this generating function in more detail, uh, if for example, uh, let's see, if I knew the log squared terms, I could take z smaller and that would, keep, that would better isolate the leading trajectory. Or similarly, if I knew uh, the heavier multi-twist guys, uh, I could take z goes, uh, I could try to take z goes to one, so the log terms are zero. But uh, yeah, there's always a contamination in extracting exactly this exponent. Thanks. No problem. Okay, so that was all uh, set up. And now, uh, we can use it to do a computation uh, in the Ising CFT. So what we'll do is we'll approximate our D-disk by a sum over a few light exchanges. So uh, I'm identity operator, I'm my Z2 even scalar epsilon, and I have the stress tensor T. And what's nice about this D-disk is that I can ignore contributions from the double twist operators themselves. So that taking the discontinuity of a single block produces these sine squared factors. And for the double twist, I get this, this approximate zero. So I can ignore self-energy corrections. And now the result is very simple. I get a finite sum for these three operators. And all the input data is known from numerics. So if you use this, uh, you can make 
uh, the following plot for your leading trajectory. So here I'm again plotting the sigma, sigma double twist operators uh, with the twist as a function of h bar. Uh, this blue curve is a prediction from inversion. The orange curve is a prediction from a light cone bootstrap. And you can see the two curves are indistinguishable for large h bar. But there are important deviations once you go down to h bar equals 5 halves, which corresponds to the stress tensor. And the inversion formula gives us uh, a slightly more accurate result for its twists. So this is telling us that if we want to make predictions at low spin, it's important to include these non-perturbative corrections. And I think uh, the, the improvement is more noticeable with the OB coefficients. Uh, so here I'm plotting this OB coefficient normalized by the large spin limit. And you can see again at large h bar, the two curves are indistinguishable. But at the stress tensor point, the inversion formula gives us a better result. So since for the rest of the talk, I'll be discussing some predictions at low spin or low h bar, uh, from here on out, I'll just use the inversion formula and won't use any predictions uh, from the light cone bootstrap. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Do you have any comment for why uh, at, uh, at the next operator, neither the inversion nor the asymptotic uh, light cone uh, work very well? Like, I mean, for the stress tensor, the inversion is very good, but, but the, the, the next operator, the spin oh, four. Oh, spin four, why this is in? It seems to be off by both uh, formulas. Yeah, I don't have a good, uh, good explanation. Um, I, this was, plot was from a year ago, so I'm not sure if I included the errors. But generally, when we're making predictions with the extremal function of OP coefficients, the error is larger. So there may be some large error term that's not been included. Um, Mm -hmm. How much do, yeah, I guess. Or it's just possible that there are subleading terms uh, in the inversion formula that uh, give a large correction at spin for spin four. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a good explanation for that. Was it the case that this blue curve depends on the value of z that you use? Yeah, that's true. Maybe if uh, we change the value of z, uh, I think for this trajectory, I said z equals 0.1. In you know, almost dimension, these operators are very small, so I could set z smaller, and maybe that would improve the prediction for both spin two and spin four. Okay. Yeah, that's a it's a it's a good problem with all these curves is that we said z equals 0.1, but it's also important to make plots where you vary z and see what you get because this is more of an this is really kind of an art than a science. Um, but it needs to be made, I think, more rigorous in the future. OK, so that's all I want to say about the Ising model. And now we can turn to the main problem about the O2 model. Uh, so first, uh, just as some background uh, to label our representations, we'll use that uh, O2 is isomorphic to a semi-direct product of U1 and Z2. So for Q greater than 1, we have 2D representations with u1 charges plus or minus q. And we also have two one-dimensional representations, uh, which I'll label zero plus minus. And they're distinguished by the action of the z2. And so now from uh, some very impressive work from the numerical bootstrap, we now have precise data for all the low-lying operators. So I'll label the charge zero plus one and two scalars by s, phi, and t. And now we have predictions for their dimensions, uh, for their OP coefficients, and also for the central charges of our theory. Uh, whereas usual, CJ and CT are the norms for J and the stress tensor T. And I normalize them by their value uh, in a theory of two free bosons. So we we'll use this as input for all the analytic computations. And now I'll just give a brief roadmap uh, for the O2 uh, results. So we'll start by looking at the leading trajectories for charge 0 plus, 0 minus, and 2. And these all correspond to the phi phi operators. 
Uh, so this analysis will be almost identical in form to the Eisen case. The only difference is that uh, we'll use, we need O2 6J symbols when we solve crossing symmetry. And two of the main results are we'll compute the reg intercept for the leading trajectory. And we'll also show that the analytic data gives us an approximate solution to crossing. Uh, then I'll move on to the charge three case. This corresponds to the phi t double twist operators. And the new technical problem is that uh, we need to invert infinite sums of double twist operators corresponding to the phi phi operators themselves. And to explain that how this sum works, it's convenient to introduce uh, large spin diagrams. And the main result here is that the charge three scalar chi uh, sits on this phi t trajectory. And finally, we'll look at charge one. So here we have two like trajectories, which are nearly degenerate. And to resolve mixing, we'll introduce a twist Hamiltonian. And the main result is that the scalar phi will be shown to sit on this phi s trajectory. And then for uh, all the experts in the room, uh, for the spinning numerical data, we'll use uh, the extremal functional at derivative order lambda equals 27. Uh, but I won't be discussing the numerics uh, for the rest of the talk. Uh, so to start with these phi phi operators, uh, we again will approximate our D-disk by a few light exchanges, our scalars and conserved operators. And once again, the D-disk will suppress contributions from the double twist operators themselves. And our result for the generating function is almost unchanged, except now we have to introduce labels for all our charges. So I need to label my generating function by which charge I'm studying, and when I'm inverting operators, uh, for C, uh, these operators O, I need to weight them by the O26J symbol curly M. Uh, but besides that, we again compute the right-hand side using dimensional reduction, and we again assume that logs res will resum in our generating functions. Uh, so if you use that, you can make the following plots. So here I'm showing the phi phi trajectories, uh, the twist as a function of spin, and I have uh, the three different charges. The dots are again predictions from the extremal functional, and the curve is a prediction uh, from the inversion formula. And you can see that if you go down to spin two, uh, the stress sensor sits on the zero plus trajectory and conserved current with spin one sits on the zero minus trajectory. Uh, and we also get nice matching for the spin two charge two operator. But as far as I know, that doesn't have its own name. And since we get this nice matching down to low spin, uh, it's very natural to see if we can push our results further and go all the way to the intercept. So it, in this plot, I'm showing the same three trajectories, uh, but now it's just a change of coordinates. So I'm plotting the spin as a function of the dimension. Uh, these solid lines are the prediction from the inversion formula, where I'm working up to 200th order in dimensional reduction. And the dashed lines are some quadratic fit where I've imposed exact shadow symmetry. So I'll make uh, two brief comments about this plot. Uh, the first is we have to work to very high orders in dimensional reduction, uh, just, because, just because here h bar is around one. So, and as you take h bar smaller, uh, dimensional reduction converges slower and slower. And the other point is that uh, the output of the inversion formula is approximately, but not exactly, shadow symmetric. So if this solid line, if this solid orange line was exactly shadow symmetric, the minimum would be at exactly delta equals three halves. But the fact we don't see exact shadow symmetry isn't surprising, because that would require knowing the exact double discontinuity. Uh, but the fact we get a good approximation, I think, is more evidence that we have a good approximation uh, to the full D-disk. 
Uh, Sorry, I have a yeah. comment. The, the shadow symmetry has nothing to do with the D-disk. It's supposed to do, uh, the inversion formula integrates the S-channel block against uh, the D-disk. It has, the, the, the sh shadow symmetry is supposed to be built in, in the S-channel block. Yeah, it's supposed to, I mean, if I, so if I use the inversion formula, right, I get poles on the right side and I get poles on the left side. And I would see shadow symmetry between the two. But I would see like this curve, I would see it meet at a cusp. And I want the curve, I want the two sides to meet smoothly. Maybe, it's, maybe I shouldn't say it's not that shadow symmetry doesn't hold, but we want, uh, we expect that the minimum sh of this curve should be at exactly delta equals three halves. Mm -hmm. What approximation do do you use for the uh, block in the direct channel? Do you use dimensional reduction also? Uh, yeah, we use dimensional reduction. In both um, channels? Uh, well, for the S-channel block, uh, we're, we're doing computations. We're, we're, we're expanding the D-disk. We're expanding the whole integrand of the inversion formula around Z equals zero. And we're in practice only keeping uh, the leading term. Um, but I don't think it has to do with dimension reduction because the dimension. Uh, so you're taking the corner limit of the S-channel block. Z to zero limit with fixed Z bar. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think that that I think it's that approximation which may break the shadow symmetry. Because the region close to the origin, you were dominated by by uh, Z and Z bar both smaller. And your approximation yeah, may like, not I mean, it be could be, but um, we can talk later. I don't see why uh, a priori, if I just give you some, uh, yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, Yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. It's just, well, it, I think it comes back to the problem that we only have an approximation to the generating function. Maybe I shouldn't have said it's because we have a good approximation to the D disk. Um, yeah, okay, this comes, yeah, I think maybe the, I, the, right, the right answer is that well, we don't have the exact generating function. If, uh, yeah. What I'm not sure about was including the higher powers of Z in the uh, S channel block. It's, it corresponds to, it's, I'm not sure, it corresponds to, I think, including effects of like multi twist operators in our generating function. And to properly resolve those mixed things, uh, I think you may need more, I think you may need more details like a twist Hamiltonian. So, uh, but okay, maybe it's just, yeah, we didn't uh, use the exact S channel block. Uh, maybe I can make a comment about that. I, I think that the, I, I agree with the first thing you said that if you just, if the only thing you do is use the uh, exact S channel block, then you just get double, uh, double twist operators and their shadows. So you just get, you get a cusp from two forty five 45 degree lines when you invert, invert individual blocks. So it, it's, Clearly, you have to you have to sum up an infinite number of blocks in the T channel to fix that problem. So, it, um, yeah, it, yeah, that's true. Yeah, if you invert, yeah, you get you get the minimum at delta goes three halves, but it wouldn't have the right shape. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah, that, that's yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, so uh, then. Could, could I also ask a question? Uh, maybe there's something I, I missed. Why does this curve have to be smooth? Uh, well, I think it follows from, I would expect it follows from ellipticity and spin. Uh, if I'm, at least as long as, long as I avoid intersection points, uh, I think it should be smooth as a function of L. Mm, I see. Yeah, so if you, uh, 
So if you take our results and you trust the fit, uh, we can use this plot uh, to make a prediction for the regintercept. And so we can show is that for the zero plus trajectory, we get L is around uh, 0.82. Uh, and this implies that our correlator is bounded in the regit limit. So uh, then you can play a similar game uh, with the OP coefficients. Uh, so here, this plot is somewhat messier uh, because we have larger errors in our numerics. But you can see that the two, uh, the two sets of results are consistent. And in particular, we get nice matching around spin 2 and spin 1. Uh, and so since we have matching at spin 1 and spin 2, we expect probably the same thing as holding at spin 20. And uh, to get the nice matching to hold, we'd have to work at a uh, higher derivative order when studying the extremal functional. Uh, so if you trust these results, then we now have a wealth of data about the CFT. So we have uh, numerical predictions for the scalars, and we have analytical predictions for all the spinning operators. And so what we'll do is we'll test crossing symmetry by plugging in the analytic results for operators of spin less than 20. And specifically, we'll look at the uh, four phi correlator and project onto zero plus exchange in the S channel. And when you do that, uh, you find the following plot. So here I'm plotting a normalized version of the correlator on the line z bar equals z. Uh, this orange curve is a prediction from the S channel OPE. The blue curve is a prediction from the T channel. And you see that. Uh, there's a large region of overlap around z equals one half. It's surprisingly large and approximate, shadow symmetry, approximate crossing symmetry holds all the way down to z equals 0.2 or z equals 0.1. And I think this result is surprising because to make this plot, we have to drop a lot of operators. So I dropped all operators of spin greater than 20 uh, and also dropped all of the higher twist trajectories. So what this result is telling us is that these heavy operators are really only important once you go around z equals 1 or z equals 0, where an OPE stops converging. There's another useful feature about this plot is it tells you uh, where we should be able to trust the D-disk. So you always calculate the D-disk around z equals 1. So it may not be clear what value of small z it breaks down. Uh, but from this curve, we expect that our approximation to the D-disk should be valid to very small z, and our region of ignorance is really only around uh, z equals zero. And I think this gives another explanation for why we are able to get ex uh, accurate results for all the spinning data. So that's all I want to say about these phi phi operators. Uh, next, I'll look at the charge three trajectory. And here we need to study the inversion formula uh, for phi t t phi. So one new complication is that we have two different generating functions for the even and odd spin data. So our full generating function takes the following form. It's the sum of a t-channel piece for phi t t phi. And we also have this, the u-channel piece, where we take the d-disk of phi t phi t. And if you want to study the even spin trajectory, you just set L equals zero and take their sum. And for the odd spin trajectory, you take the difference. And now we have two different kind of inversion problems to consider. So for phi t t phi, I need to invert these light operators, but also all these double twists. While for phi t phi t, I just have to invert phi itself. So the problem of doing this inversion uh, is already is the same as before. So from now, for now on, I'll just focus on inverting these uh, phi phi operators. So what we'll do is we'll expand our D-disk again in terms of the conformal blocks. As usual, we get the OP coefficients times some sign factors which come from taking the D-disk. And you can see that if you set O to be a phi phi double twist, there's two different inversion problems you have to consider. 
uh, first to determine these uh, OP coefficients, we need to study the phi phi TT correlator. So roughly speaking, the inversion formula tells you how to glue together these two phi's to produce this product of OP coefficients. And of course, we also need to know the spectrum of the phi phi operators. Uh, but to do this, we study the four phi correlator, uh, which we already handled in the previous section. And then for the infinite sum over L, we'll just break our sum into two pieces. So we'll set some cutoff on the spin. And for all operators below that cutoff, we invert each block individually. And for all operators above that cutoff, we use the large spin asymptotics for our OPE data. And then we can perform all these uh, large spin sums using some SO to our identities. And here it's important that we do the infinite sum first and then do the inversion since the two don't commute. And so this procedure, I think, looks, can look very technical, uh, but it's nicely captured when you think in terms of some large spin diagrams. So these aren't actual Feynman diagrams, but they're a nice heuristic for organizing our calculations. So what I described before was a large spin box diagram for phi tt phi. And a way to read this is that you should first perform a t-channel cut and since you cut two phi, two phi lines, this just tells you to include the phi phi double twist operators in the t-channel d-disk. And when you cut the box like this, you get two four-point functions. I have the four phi correlator, and I also have the phi phi tt correlator. So that just tells you, you determine how phi phi couples to the external operators by studying inversion problems for these two four-point functions. And then roughly speaking, the infinite sum over phi phi in the T channel is dual to a T phi exchange in the S channel. In practice, what this means is that when you do the infinite sum and inversion, you produce higher logs for the phi T operators. So in my generating function, I have the regular and the log piece, which are familiar from inverting individual blocks. Uh, but this log squared term only comes from the infinite sum. And you can read off the number of logs by noting that all my S channel cuts are identical. I have, three phi t I have two external phi t cuts, which give me the regular and the log piece. And this extra internal cut uh, gives me a log squared. Uh, so I won't go through the procedure of doing the infinite sum. And instead, I'll just present the result. So if you use uh, all those inversion problems, you can make a prediction for the charge three trajectories. So the blue curve is the even spin trajectory, and the orange curve is the odd spin one. And you can see again, there's nice agreement down to low spin. And the interesting feature of this plot is that the blue curve is tending upwards as we go to L equals zero. And this is interesting because we know from the extremal functional that there's a charge three scalar with dimension around 2.1. So to make an analytic prediction, what we'll do is we'll zoom in around the L equals zero region and increase P max. And we find that there's a charge three scalar with dimension around 1.995. So here I'm showing the same plot as before, twist as a function of spin, but now around L equals zero. And each of these curves corresponds to different orders and dimension reduction. So this is P max equals 20, P max equals 40. And as you go to P max equals 100, you can see it's converging to this value. And what we find is that the deviation between the numerics and analytics is just uh, five or six percent. And so I think this gives strong evidence that the phi t trajectory is analytic down to spin zero. And at that point, we have the, the scalar chi. And here it's also important that uh, for this problem, h bar is around one. So this analysis is very far outside the regime of large h bar or large spin perturbation theory. 
And in fact, we can get a result close to the numerical one. I think it's just telling us that we have a good approximation for our generating function. And so now we have a picture for the charge three trajectory. So in terms of the same true Fauci plot, I have my phi t operators, which are becoming linear at large spin. And as I go down to spin zero, the first operator I hit corresponds to chi. And then chi tilde sits on the other half of this trajectory. And there's a similar analysis you can do for the OP coefficients. Uh, so again, we get nice matching, but there are these large errors from numerics. Uh, so finally, I want to discuss the charge one case. So here we have uh, a new problem that we have two uh, nearly degenerate uh, trajectories. So you can see it for phi t and phi s, their twists become comparable at infinite spin. And to resolve this mixing, we'll need to introduce a matrix of generating functions. So I have my diagonal elements phi t t phi and phi s s phi, which are the naive objects we'd study to determine these operators. And we also have phi t s phi, which measures any potential mixing. And to actually determine the spectrum, uh, we need to introduce uh, the twist Hamiltonian. So this brings us back to the problem that we have an approximation for our generating function, uh, but not the full thing. So this matrix of generating functions in principle should have the following form. So here H is the twist Hamiltonian for the charge one sector. And capital lambda is the matrix of OP coefficients. But again, in practice, when we invert operators of bounded twist, we only get an approximation which has uh, logs and also won't exactly take this form. So we play the same game as before. We'll try to isolate our leading trajectory and avoid large logs by working at small but finite z. Uh, so to get the twist Hamiltonian, we'll take the following combination of our generating functions and find the eigenvalues at z equals 0.1. So you can see if I had the exact uh, generating function, this object would spit out exactly h. And there's a similar prescription for the OP coefficients, uh, but I won't go through that today. So if you use the twist Hamiltonian, you find the following prediction for the charge one operators of even spin. So again, we get nice matches down to low spin. And we see that our phi s trajectory is going up as we approach L equals zero. And what we find is that there's a scalar with dimension around 2.37. And you can compare this with the dimension of phi tilde, which has dimension three minus delta phi or 2.48. And so we see the deviation is only 4%. And I think this gives, gives, gives good evidence that phi tilde sits on this trajectory. So if we make another true Fauci plot, uh, here I'm just plotting the phi s operators. Uh, we see at large spin, again, it's linear. But now when you hit L equals zero, the first operator you see corresponds to phi tilde. And phi itself sits on the shadowed half of this trajectory. And so this tells us that there's more freedom of, in terms of where scalars can sit. So the spinning physical operators always sit to the right half of the vertical line, while the local scalar can sit possibly on the, to the left or to the right. And finally, there's a similar analysis you can do for the odd spin operators. And I think this is also a good point to show why mixing was important. So if I make the same plot, so I'm going to present the same plot, uh, but now this orange curve is a prediction using a twist Hamiltonian, and the blue curve is a prediction if you forgot about mixing. And you see that uh, this blue curve is very far off, even when you go to L equals 15 or 19, where we expect large spin perturbation theory to work. Uh, so this is just to emphasize that like uh, dimension reduction, 
and including infinite sums. Using twist Hamiltonian is important if you want to get accurate results. Uh, so that's all I want to say uh, for the main results. And in the remaining uh, five minutes, I want to tie up some loose ends. So you can ask, uh, what happened to S and T? So I gave evidence that the scalars phi and chi sit on regular trajectories. But it may not be clear where S and T sit because the plots I showed you before for the zero plus and charge two trajectories never reach L equals zero. They have a minimum around 0.8 and 0.75. And instead, our expectation from perturbation theory is that these operators do sit on regular trajectories, but they'll sit on some lower branches. Uh, so to explain this, we can go back to free field theory. So here I'm showing the regular trajectories for a free scalar in three dimensions. And it's very simple. I get this diagonal line for the physical double traces. And I have this line for the shadow operators. And you can see that while the upper branch stops at 1 half, the lower branch contain, uh, hits L equals 0 at two points. And so you can capture uh, both curves with a simple equation. You just set uh, the product to be 0, and this captures this branch, and this captures uh, this branch. And when we include interactions, what we'll do is we'll just make an ansatz where we replace 2 delta phi by some parameter a of q. And instead of setting the right-hand side to 0, we'll set it to this parameter b of q. And the way to think about this is that a is the effective twist, and b will be the effective coupling. So as an example, if you set a to 1.1 and b to 0.1, you produce the following two curves. So having a non-zero B has removed the intersection, but you see the lower branch still intersects the L equals zero line at two points. So what we'll do with the O2 model is we'll take this ansatz and we'll fit it to the data from the inversion formula around the region uh, delta equals three halves. And the main virtue of this ansatz is that it automatically will capture uh, both branches. Uh, so if you do this, you find that the two A parameters are about the same. It's 1.05. Uh, B for the zero plus trajectory is 0.13, and B for charge two is 0 0.09. And I should say it was, it was this equation plus these uh, parameters, which were actually used to make the earlier fits. So now if I set L equals zero, we find that there's a charge two scalar with dimension around 1.17. And the deviation from the exact result is just around 5%. So I think this gives uh, strong evidence that the, ch the charge two scalar T uh, does sit on the lower branch of our regular trajectories. Uh, but unfortunately, the results are worse for the charge zero plus scalar. So here the prediction is 1.76. And the exact result is 1.511. And the deviation now is around 16.5%. So I think what this is telling us is that while we do have evidence that there should be a charge zero plus scalar on the lower trajectory, if you want to make an accurate prediction, we either need a better ansatz or we need a better approximation for our double discontinuity we need to include more operators. Uh, but this, I think, is an interesting open problem. So just to wrap up uh, very briefly, uh, we've used the inversion formula to compute the leading trajectories in the O2 CFT. And this involves a combination of dimension reduction, infinite sums of 2D blocks, and the twist Hamiltonian. And as output, we now have a nice picture for the four phi correlator. So here I'm plotting this correlator again projected to the charge zero plus sector and I'm normalized by an MFT correlator. 
And uh, we make this plot by just using the S channel OPE around Z equals zero, the T channel OPE around Z equals one, and the U channel uh, for large Z. So we now have a picture for how our four point function behaves for a generic uh, Euclidean configurations. And I think there is a lot of uh, interesting questions still to consider. So the first problem is about improving our analysis. So first you can ask, uh, how can we improve our prediction for S? And as I said before, we likely need to include uh, more operators in our D disk or have a better approximation for our generating function. And there's also the problem about how to properly study triple twist operators. So I neglected them for the entirety of this talk. But in principle, this operator could mix with a charge three double twist. So to, to uh, include these operators, we likely need to understand crossing symmetry and the inversion formula uh, for higher point functions. I also think there's a lot of interesting applications for spinning operators. So I gave evidence today that the stress tensor sits on the phi phi trajectory. So this means in principle, we should be able to compute uh, the JJT three point function by studying the inversion formula for JJ phi phi. And here I think a combination of dimension reduction and weight shifting uh, could be very useful. And there's also a more general problem about studying OP of light array operators and detector event shapes. And these Lorenzian observables also depend on knowing the analytically continued OPE data. And finally, as a very general problem, it would be interesting to better understand the space and nature of CFTs that have analyticity spin zero, and if it's possible to constrain these CFTs analytically, uh, either in perturbation theory or non perturbatively. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. All right. Um, thank you very much for, for a nice talk. Um, uh, are there any questions? I have a question. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Is it, is it possible to, so in, in, in your analysis, you use numerical bootstrap uh, data to set it up. But there was originally a dream, I think, expressed in, in David's paper on the easing, similar analysis for the easing, that perhaps you can just forget about numerical bootstrap and just from the consistency of the whole picture, you know, construct something like a light cone analogy to, to Gliotz's method or something like that, which could be systematically improved. Okay, module these difficulties with, with triple twist operators and, and such. So what's the status of that dream? Uh, I think this, I mean, the status is still uh, a work in progress. Uh, I don't think, I mean, it is very interesting. And so, and that, it was that dream that motivated, I think, understanding elasticity down to low spin. So conceivably from uh, requiring that we have the stress center with the right dimension OP coefficients, and then also for like, phi and charge and for the charge three scalar chi, we can start to fit, we can start to put constraints on the OPE data. And in David's paper, he, he showed how to get a constraint also by studying uh, terms in a four point function with a vanishing double discontinuity. And so, yeah, you could, you could definitely play a similar game and it would be interesting to do that. Um, I think there's, I think the main problem is getting elasticity to work down to spin zero, that we may need to know uh, how to recover the dimensions. Let's say in the IZ model, the dimension of sigma and uh, epsilon to a high degree of precision. Um, there's also a problem about bounding errors. I, mean, I think uh, with all this, uh, with all these results, the, the results from numerics in the extremal function are a good benchmark about where we should trust our results. Um, but if you don't have that, if you don't have an estimate for the transfer charge beforehand, um, well, 
Well, okay, I guess well, it doesn't matter. If you're playing a game, yeah, you're playing a game. I mean, you can play a game with I mean, it, but it's, yeah. I mean, Gliotzi played his game, and to some extent it worked. Yeah. And then, by, by the game, uh, somebody should probably Would push be. what you're doing. Well, yeah, I, but I that's agree. What just we try. I guess I will have a related question. So the the fact that it's hard to get S is uh is is really a difficulty with this game here. And and for for Ising, the fact that you can't get the uh, epsilon to any reasonable accuracy uh, from continuing the sigma sigma zero uh, trajectory is is causing real difficulty because then you don't have enough constraints to close the equations. Yeah, but, but you can also imagine like varying S. And as just external data and requiring that you get the right spin to, I think that would be a hope, maybe more. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it'd be nice if we can just analytically predict the dimension of S, but uh, maybe it can be fixed if you know enough data, if you require, you have enough constraints on like the spin two operator or spin one operators. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, the whole thing also about requiring operators of not spectrum and posing some non perturbative equation of motion. That should give more constraints. But um, yeah, I think the main, I mean, for me, I think the main issue is just making some of this more rigorous. And I think that would include, it would require understanding triple twist better. Um, okay, thanks. I see that uh, Hugh has a question. So is there any reason why your parameter B should be positive in your uh, I think, let's see. Um, if B is negative, and they may not, like in this plot, they're meeting like, uh, like an upper branch and a lower branch here, I guess. In principle, I don't think there's a reason. I think this is, expected shape for leading trajectory and so it should go down and then curve upwards. Uh, Would it affect the curvature of the trajectories? Say again? Well, in one, if it was negative, then maybe the trajectories will not be convex in the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, there's also convexity for a leading spectrum, so uh, you want this, you want this shape. But maybe for the subleading trajectories, you could imagine crazier things. Uh, our yeah, understanding that, of yeah, the convexity applies for the q equals zero one. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The q equals zero one has to look like that, but other ones it's hard to predict. Yeah. The charge two, I think, yeah, don't have convexity, but it seems the same shape. There's like, a general problem about understanding like subleading trajectories and how they behave. And uh, here, this is nice. I can continue it uh, all the way down. To, well. Now this spin too, but you can imagine trajectory. There are there are some issues about whether trajectories actually reach like, down to spin four, or spin six, or whether they stop. So you can imagine for more complicated objects, B could be negative. I don't have a first principles argument for all trajectories. There's there's some folklore. I, I think for me, mostly due to Simone, um, that you should be able to think of L as being like a Hamiltonian and delta minus three halves is sorry, being like a parameter. Sorry, can you not hear me? Sorry, my audio didn't work for a second. Okay, I, I was saying the folklore is that you should be able to think of L as being like a Hamiltonian and delta minus three halves as being like a parameter. And under that folklore, you should imagine that you have a family of Hamiltonians and therefore the eigenvalues will move around as a function of delta minus three halves and they'll uh, repel each other. So that, that tells you that you kind of expect them to repel each other uh, as is in that plot there, but, but you don't expect them to collide, which is what would happen if uh, BQ were negative. Mm -hmm. But that's just folklore. Yeah. I mean, if you play up these, if you play up a quadratic phase, you can make a curve that goes like this. And then, uh, I don't know. I don't think that's, uh, I think it's just, like, I mean, that would have violated convexity, but you, you can maybe imagine more complicated stuff once you get to subleading guys. This onset is essentially assuming some symmetry about reflection symmetry about the horizontal axis, right? Uh, yes, yeah. So it, it imposes shadow symmetry and there's also symmetry about the horizontal axis, which 
is not it's not actually there in the full theory. So it's okay. the way to think about this ensemble is just it's just meant to work around the delta to three halves region and what happens at large L or in other regions. It just it just break down before then. Mm -hmm. Right. Have you fitted this to subleading trajectories? Uh, sorry, say again. I mean, have you done this kind of picture for subleading trajectories? Uh, so we didn't do it for the O2 case, but in, in David's work on the Ising model, they also have he also had results uh, for the subleading trajectories. Um, I, I don't. I don't think the results were that different. There were larger anomalous dimensions, uh, but that's it. I don't think they were good yeah. enough to extend all the way down to this uh, regime. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. The results were for like, yeah, for spin for spin two. It's uh, you, yeah, you, 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 you would know, but like for spin four and higher, I guess it was it was for that region. I see that Balt has a question. Yes. Um, it is about um, the, I have some basic confusion about sort of the original derivation of the Lorenzian inversion formula. I thought there were some uh, parts that were, some arcs at infinity in this story that were dropped. Um, and that you can safely drop if the, if the coordinator, if your spin is high enough, but not if, if the spin is very low. Um, and then you are in trouble and uh, maybe you need to um, take those contributions into account. So is there any way to sort of estimate the contribution? If this is true, this, this picture, maybe I'm just confused, but if it's true, is there some way to estimate these contributions from these arcs at infinity and see if there's some kind of extra term you would need to add to get the spin zero spectrum correct? Yeah, I mean, you're worried about uh, whether I can continue down to spin zero if the right intercept is greater, is, I mean, is greater than zero? About I think that's a, a reformulation of my question. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, you, uh, I mean, you can try to check if the result is consistent because that, yeah, that the region, the large arcs, if I remember correctly, comes from the Regi limit. So maybe you could take this result, go down to understand this trajectory around delta goes three halves and then try to plug that back in using the conformal Regi theory and see what you get. Um, yeah, I think a, a, a related, uh, related thing you, you can ask is, uh, uh, it's analogous to superconvergence. So, so, so like uh, Lorentz inversion converge above the blue the blue curve, and and to reach below the blue curve, we have to think about some analytic continuation. And the way you analytic continue things like. Is this, this 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 transform is that you subtract uh, so so if you use conformal rigid theory to subtract the blue curve, then you expect to have convergence down to the orange curve. And in particular, if you put yourself on the x-axis at zero point five, you will have convergence below uh, spin zero. So so the statement that this orange curve is uh, the crossing of orange curve and the, the statement that the spin zero states are meaningful is, is the statement that after you subtract the blue curve, if you go at the x equal 0.5, the, the, uh, uh, you have, you have uh, the correlator vanishes in the rigid limit. I see, I see, thank you. Yeah. Is yeah, there there's a potential. Way? Sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say there's potential obstructions when you get down to even lower spin. Um, about if we don't know the, if we don't know, uh, if we don't know the trajectories of operators of these negative spin well enough for this analytically continued function, then there, there's difficulty in continuing below. Go, so we can, it, in the, I mean, there's a nice argument. It's in Simone's paper about why we can go down to spin zero in the Ising and O2 CFT, but yeah, for generic theories, there is an issue about how far we can analytically continue down.
Yeah, I was going to ask if there's a if there's a way of estimating the order of magnitude of the contribution of the triple twist operators. I had a um, so yeah. One way to estimate them, uh, let's see. I mean, it is possible to include them. One option is uh, we know how to do some infinite sums to produce uh, the triple twist operators in a generating function. It requires uh, doing some infinite sums uh, of these phi phi operators, and that would give you at least a piece of the triple twist contribution. Um, I think there's also an argument. Uh, yeah, I mean, th th yeah, I think that would give that would give an estimate. Um, the problem is that uh, triple twists and those higher twists can appear. I, I described one infinite sum you can do to get an estimate, but uh, there's also things like you have, to, you have to invert an infinite sum of triple twist operators and they would give you triple twist operators in the generating function. Um, so I'm not sure how to estimate, how to, well, that, yeah, that's, yeah, I think you can get an estimate maybe by uh, including, you know, you know at least how part of the triple twists contribute to the generating function, but they're, they're I don't know how to estimate the, any subleading pieces. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. It comes down to like what kind of large spin diagrams you can draw. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's see, where is it? So yeah, here I drew a, a box diagram. If you want to worry about triple twists, you'd have to add another vertical line here. Right. Uh, sorry, I want to do S channel. Let's see, I add a vertical line here. And then what I'm saying is I know how to do infinite sums over like the five phi's. Um, well, I can use annotate. Let me let me draw it so it's clear. Uh, okay, I can add a, another line here, and then what I'm saying is that I know how to do an infinite sum for this phi phi cut and this phi phi cut. It basically amounts to uh, uh, squaring the anomalous dimensions and doing the infinite sum. But the piece I don't know is this kind of cut. So I don't, so I'd have to, like if I have this cut, I would be, I'd be doing a triple twist cut and then I have to understand how to do infinite sums of triple twist operators and put them back and invert them. So that's the piece where I think it's, that, that piece is difficult to estimate. I see, Th thanks. Are there any other questions? Uh. I have a quick question and a comment. Uh, first, but thanks, David. It was a great talk. Uh, just a quick comment about the spin four guy in the three D Ising, uh, where the Lorentz, uh, where the result uh, from the Lorentz standing version was then uh, right on top of the point. Uh, I just want to say that the result of the inversion formula can be very much improved, and the the precision can be much improved once you consider better truncation in the calculation of the double disk. So, it, yeah, that's um, yeah. Well, that's the one before. Sorry. Yeah, I was trying to erase the green line. Uh, right, it was the the OP coefficient. Uh, both for the OP coefficient and their twist. Yeah, so. The inversion formula can be improved to lie uh, right on top of uh, right on the on the point once you include uh, other terms in the expansion of the double disk. So it's a, it can yeah and it can be done in a stable way uh, in terms of the dependence on z. So that's just an update. And okay uh, yeah so you sorry yeah go ahead. No so I was gonna say yeah you included the five phi. Uh, sorry, the, the sigma sigma and epsilon epsilon double twist operators did the infinite sum and varied z and that gave a better result. And yeah, 
yeah, yeah. Basically, the inversion formula curve would lie on top of uh, on the on top of the points, so it would give you a better accuracy, like ten to the minus four or ten to the minus five. It's just an update. So the okay. the fact that we see that the inversion formula doesn't lie on top of the point can be, yeah, it's just an artifact that we are not including enough terms uh, in the double disk. So that can be improved. Uh, Another thing is about the Regi, uh, Regi intercept of the O2. I just, uh, so for the S channel block, for the direct channel block, uh, you said that you use the collinear block approximation. Uh, in principle, you can have the exact block for the, uh, for the S channel block to using the 3D to do the expansion, right? So I was wondering if you compare with that to see how good collinear approximation is doing for this channel block for such a small delta, basically delta close to three half. Yeah, uh, we didn't do that, but it'd be interesting to compare. Uh, so what I said before, I didn't really explain it was, um, yeah, with our, with our generating function computations, uh, we always expand it around small z. So this amounts, to, yeah, as you said, taking the collinear approximation for the S channel block and the inversion formula. And the motivation is that if you think in a small z expansion, uh, right, all the higher order terms correspond to the higher n trajectories and multi twist operators. And so, one maybe one concern that's not really an issue is if I want to include higher z's in my generating function. To properly understand the system, I should include a larger twist Hamiltonian. I should be I should be studying the twist Hamiltonian where uh, I'm distinguishing. The, I'm trying to resolve any mixing between the n equals zero and the n equals one trajectories. Yeah, that may not be an issue though because they have uh, the dimensions are, are pro the, the difference in twist is two, so maybe you don't have to worry about mixing, and I could just include more powers of z in the generating function. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be an interesting thing to do. And uh, so one yeah. thing is that, uh, yeah, Z is not a uh, small one problem is that another problem is the, is actually Delta being close to three half. So the collinear approximation for the full block, uh, there, there was also the shadow term, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Become, yeah. So that shadow term becomes important when you, when you consider Delta of order three half, uh, yeah, so if you can take your z smaller to remove the yeah the contribution of the higher twist guys, but that problem of uh, delta being of order three half still remains. And I think that's uh, a slightly different. I mean, I agree. It's a mm -hmm. it's a uh, so the way we thought about this is that the other pole. Uh, the the shadow half yeah the shadow pole gives me this plot that now uh, that is now reflected along the vertical axis. And so you can still ask even forgetting about the region delta equals three halves if I have a fit like even for this guy I have a fit yeah. and for my physical op not, not for the physical operators but to the right of the trajectory and this curve doesn't look like it's shadow symmetric. I would still, if I had a good enough fit, it would look like it had a minimum slightly to the right of delta equals three halves, and then it would, and it would peak back upwards. Um, so, I, yeah, I think, I think if you thought about it in terms of the inversion formula, at least my expectation is that we have, uh, we can think about one pole or the either, one, one pole or the other, and then we require that the curves should meet smoothly at delta equals three halves. Um, so I agree maybe with the, you're, I don't know, can maybe I, you're- can I, try to, yeah. can I try to phrase it um, uh, in a slightly different way? So um, in, in this plot, the, um, the type of extrapolation that we're doing is, we're, we're not looking at the we're not we're not really doing the honest thing of evaluating the D-disk in the Reggie regime and computing its um, behavior. But that's what you would really need to do to pick, pick out the Reggie intercept, and and we we can't do that because we don't know the D-disk well enough in that regime. So instead, we're 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 cheating and computing the 
tra the trajectory. And when we compute the trajectory, we're using our expectation that there's a single trajectory at some finite anomalous dimension. Whereas, of course, the D-disk doesn't give us finite anomalous dimensions. It gives us infinitesimal anomalous dimensions. So we, we, um, uh, we use our expectation that there should be a single trajectory um, and uh, draw a curve in the, uh, in the larger spin region um, based on that expectation. And then we're just extrapolating the curve down. So we're not really honestly looking at the, uh, at the Reggie limit of the D-disk here. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're asking about, Zara, is what you would need to do if you wanted to actually look at the Reggie regime of the D-disk and integrate the inversion formula there. And yeah. um, that's a really interesting thing to think about. It's not something that we really attempted. Okay, so what uh, what was the value of delta that you stopped at? Uh, the smallest delta that you considered? Yeah, uh, sorry, I may, have, I may have misinterpreted your question. I thought you were also computing, in your paper, I thought you were also computing uh, the leading trajectories, but... Uh, uh, yeah, anyway, we, so... We're also, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we also don't try to expand the, the, the D-disk in the rigid limit. We, we also approach it from, uh, from, from large delta. But uh, mm. but we but we include corrections to the corneal limit of the blocks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. The, which, it is, which we found are, are important. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Just to, I just to, just to return the previous question. Uh, so we stopped. We set. We uh, for this plot and making these fits. We stop at h bar around like one point one. It's really a fit between h bar between one point one and one point five. And that's why it, that's why it's uh, it's not the same delta for each of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Are there any other questions? I guess if not, let's just thank David again for a nice talk. Thank you. And I'll see you guys next week.